without a goal i feel lost truthfully yeah like if i'm not and for a while it was all lifting related goals but once that wasn't a thing anymore i was like i gotta find a new goal i i so that's where the 140 half marathon comes in it's i need something to work towards or i literally would probably lose my mind I'd, I'd be so depressed i wouldn't know what to do with myself so we all need an outlet to where we're like pursuing something difficult to sharpen us Welcome to the Zero Quit Podcast, where I bring you candid conversations with elite athletes, entrepreneurs, specialists, and other creatives. I'm your host, Brock Covington, and through these dialogues, you will hear powerful stories and practical advice that will help you live a more active and intentional life. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend. What's going on, guys? Welcome to today's podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Pete Rubish. He is an athlete, coach, and entrepreneur based out of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where he owns Coa Strength and Fitness with his wife, Kelly. As a competitive powerlifter, he's boasted a 772-pound squat, 45 bench, and 920-pound deadlift. What's going on, man? Not much, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. It's a, it's Honestly, it's a pleasure, and it's a, a really funny thing. I, I told you when uh, I messaged you to, uh, to have you on the show was that you know you're someone that I've I've seen in the lifting space ever since I got into it. I, I consider you whether you consider or not very much like a cult figure in the the lifting space, universal of whether it's powerlifting or just lifting in general. And um so it's really cool to kind of see, you know, people like you and uh, even like Alan Thrall um had had followed me and so forth. Like these different people I'd looked up to and watched on YouTube um for, for like so long coming like not coming to me, but you know, connecting with them from not necessarily a place of lifting. But of all things, a place of running, it's kind of very funny to see like this kind of full circle switch in a lot of lifters lives in that way. Yeah, I think it's kind of a natural progression because all of us have been into heavy lifting for so long. And, you know, you yeah. go down that, ro that road for half your life. Um, and for me, I even took it further, like uh, Mark Bell as well. I mean, took steroids, mm -hmm. did all this stuff, did all that for nine years and really pushed it. And now it's like. I just want to be healthier. I don't want to, I want to live longer. I have a daughter now, 14 months old. I have a wife. There's a lot more responsibilities. So it's, you go from a place of just trying to be as strong as possible and, you know, not really caring about your health so much to wanting to be healthier, lean down a lot and, and get into running. And that's kind of been the natural progression. So I think that's kind of why Alan Thrall's come around to it too. And even though he's never mm -hmm. been on steroids, but Mark Bell as well, he's another one. He's uh he's really trying to live a more healthier lifestyle now. So I think we're gonna. He's see got a that lot beautiful of head of hair now too. Yeah, yeah, he's got the crazy awesome hair now going. <laughs> Looks completely I different. I know, maybe. I know. I I saw him the other day run. I was like, wait, is that Mark? But uh, anyway, let let's dig right into that. You know, powerlifting career because that's obviously where you really have like made a name for yourself, and I think a great way to kind of tell your story and lead into other things. So, you know, the first thing I think of is those old school basement videos, you know, where you're just slamming insane weight, just pixelated kind of blurry camera, camcorder deal, those old school videos. So take me back to, you know, those origins and like kind of the mindset of, of young Pete lifting in the basement because, you know, we can get to it a little bit later, but powerlifting and like the kind of career aspect and the perception of it has changed a lot over the years. So take me back to those, you know, early days. Yeah, I mean, I started out lifting pretty similar to everybody else, like just to kind of uh, build up my physique, build up self-confidence, um, try to get, yeah. you know, the attention of girls and stuff like that. And I, I kind of was a loner. I, I was in high school. I kind of kept to myself and, you know, just I literally would like read the newspaper at lunch, like the sports section. And I would just sit at yeah, the table yeah. with like one or two other guys who were kind of outcasts. And we just ignore. we didn't even talk. Like we were just like, all right, we're just mind our own business they would like to be reading a book i'd be reading the sports section i'd be eating my like chicken and and rice and these spinach protein shakes i would make and stuff mm -hmm. and then i just pretty much would go about my day and pay attention try to be a good student ignore everybody and go home and lift and so yeah i just felt like uh, i wasn't in that party and scene like everybody else i wasn't popular and i just wanted to become somebody where i was like okay i'm gonna make a name for myself and it kind of naturally led to lifting the progression led to lifting because that's what i enjoyed so i was you know i'd come home after school go to my basement lift for a couple hours and it just became you know a ritual where i loved it i i loved getting stronger i loved that feeling it was so empowering um seeing your physique mm -hmm. change so it it turned into something where it was just my number one passion and the one thing i miss about those days is like when you're coming up and you basically have nothing, like you've haven't, you know, there, there, it's it's so pure. Yeah. There's 
there's the purity of it that you can't replicate now. Um, as you yeah. said, it's different powerlifting. Like there's more of a social media. There's way more of a social media presence. That wasn't a thing at all back then. It was just like, I did it for the love of it. There wasn't anything tied yeah. to it. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, it probably started like a decade, give or take, um, later than you, but the same concept where social media was like there, but it wasn't really a place for influencers and people weren't really posting that stuff. But I, I really like what you talked about, the purity of it, because I, I was, you know, much of the same way. I wasn't like, you know, an outcast, but I wasn't really fitting in with the popular kids. I didn't want to drink or party and do all of that. And I found a lot of comfort and uh, empowerment through, like you mentioned, just lifting where, you know, you're going through your whole day, you're just kind of, you know, zoning out of the classroom looking at muscle and fitness or bodybuilding.com forums and so forth and you're just like well just when i get home i'm gonna crush these like rice cakes or whatever book it you know to the gym or in your case of the basement and um just like the passion for it and then also because you're starting from a place of like nothing all you have is like growth and the the gains are faster and you can see them a lot more apparent and it's just so uh addicting in that way so um yeah i i resonate completely because nowadays too time to that is uh, you know you kind of mentioned what you were eating i was thinking on my run this morning about how you know i used to bring like cold chicken and rice and a tupperware to school you know like sophomore junior year for lunch and you know other kids would just look at me like i was like you know <laughs> like a weirdo like what the hell is this guy doing just bringing like cold chicken and rice but uh but nowadays you know kids understand it it's like bodybuilding or powerlifting is like the cool thing to do now and it's uh it's just a very different you know crowd like when i went to the gym i'm sure when you did to commercial gyms it wasn't young crowds it was like older dudes maybe ex-military um you had you know a few people that were into these you know niche sports but nowadays you go there's a lot younger crowd there's a lot more women into it and um the culture's really changed but switching back to to your situation so you're powered in this basement um walk me through where you ended up getting into more of the competitive side of things doing meets and then um eventually starting uh, anabolics PED use. Yeah, so my uh, my buddy who I met at university, University of Wisconsin, he kind of took me under his wing. He was a pretty strong guy himself. He was benching around 405 pounds and deadlifting like 650 pounds. And he kind of saw the potential I had, especially with deadlift. So he yeah. started training with me in my basement. He was the guy who was always like yelling at me and became kind of iconic in the sense of like being the motivational training partner guy. And he has yeah. a huge successful gym now of him, you know, of his own Madtown Fitness in Madison, Wisconsin, where he's got like an insane amount of members. He's killing it. But he put everything he yeah. had into that. But he was he kind of got me into powerlifting. He uh, told me about competitions, and I had no idea what that was. So he he got me me going down that road to where I did my first meet at seventeen, which was a USAPL meet. And uh, I showed up. I didn't even have a singlet on, on meet day because I didn't know you needed one. I thought you lifted in, like, shorts. <laughs> so I had to, like, borrow a singlet, and I didn't know the commands, and it was just a disaster. And uh, yeah. I just hated the experience. But then <laughs> I came back to it a couple years later, and um, he really pushed me into it to where things started to take off. I saw I was, like, out deadlifting everyone at the meets, even guys who were, like, mm -hmm. had been doing it way longer. I was I was at the top of the the flights for deadlift i was i was finishing heavier so yeah then i kind of got around like the lily bridges and, and chris hickson and mm -hmm. like I, chris hickson kind of was like blowing up at that point he was a year younger than me and he was really taking off and he kind of introduced me to peds as far as i saw what he was doing on them where he was taking mm -hmm. um even just pro hormones that you could buy off amazon.com like Back in that yeah. time, you could get... It used to be the Wild West. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could get Super Droll, which is stronger than just about every other oral steroid. But you could get Super Droll off Amazon, like 80 <laughs> bucks a bottle. Yeah. And uh, it was called M Droll, the version of Super Droll we would get. And I saw what he was doing, and you know, they introduced me to like testosterone and stuff. So I started getting into that. Where I just wanted mm -hmm. to compete, I wanted to like, I didn't want anyone to be better than me. So I was like, I'm going to take it to the next yeah. level and do what the other guys are doing. So at 20 years old, I started taking PEDs. Um, so you didn't really have any kind of second guess or, or think about it? Or it was kind of more like, oh, this is the next step. These other guys are doing it. Or did you have any situation where you thought about it for a week or two or a month? Or how'd that go? 
Uh, it was a pretty fast decision. I mean, at the time, I ran it by my girlfriend at the time, and she was not about it. Yeah. But it was. <laughs> but I was like, I just want to compete yeah. with these guys. I'm gonna do it. Um, it was a, you know, 20 years old. I wasn't thinking through it real thoroughly. Yeah, not as rational. Yeah, less rational decisions at 20. Yeah. I just yeah, I just was like, let's jump in the water and get rolling because especially, and you got to think at that time. This is around 2010. There were not all the deaths in the industry like there are mm -hmm. now. Like now we've seen a lot of guys mm -hmm. die but back then there weren't that many because it wasn't as uh, it was more underground it was a lot harder to get access to so mm -hmm. you know you didn't think there were like all that many consequences this is around the time that uh chris bell's documentary bigger stronger faster came out yeah so i just was like all right people aren't dying from this i'm in my 20s i'm gonna be fine um turns out like nowadays there's been a lot of people dying from yeah things related yeah. to steroid use yeah, it's been pretty wild recently to see um, John Meadows. Uh, what is it, Cedric McMillan? There's a, there's a lot more on the Palatin side or uh, bodybuilding side specifically. But like you mentioned, I think people are starting to kind of wake up and see, you know, okay, the consequences aren't immediate, but like the long term thing. Um, I, I know you mentioned on a, on a previous podcast you did like Dallas McCarver. I had met him at a like a meet and greet thing at some supplement store like months before he died. And again, I think he was like 22 at the time. So it is like one of those things where um yeah like there's there's real concerns but when you're young you have that sense of invincibility right yeah i mean i could we could keep going because it's like um sean roden a bunch of other guys yeah him too i've seen so many deaths to where i'm like wow this is not and i've gotten i've talked to a lot of guys who have heart major heart issues now so i think that's what kind of led me um away from it and then at the same time like i was trying to have a child so I came off everything. That was kind of the initial catalyst, but it just, it snowballed into like, I want to take care of my health and I want to lean down because the one thing people don't talk about is it's not just the anabolic steroids and such, the growth hormone insulin that's killing everybody. It's being a very heavy body weight. So whether it's heavy muscle body, or fat, yeah. like mm -hmm. the heavier body weight is a lot of burden on the heart, the organs. Um, and I didn't want to be 250 pounds anymore with sleep apnea. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I've even talked to my wife about that. And I've, you know, I haven't used PEDs and I haven't even gotten that large. The highest I ever got, um, just like bodybuilding when I was purely doing that was like 205 pounds. And I was just like a fluffier, you know, looking. And, um, but even, you know, with what I'm doing right now with a lot of this hybrid style, I was telling her, I was like, you know, a lot of times I want to, you know, look in the mirror, be more jacked, go through some, maybe some months of some bulking and so forth. But then I'm like, you know, for what? Everything is always going to be relative. I'm always going to look at the next guy and think I'm small. But then also, you know, long term wise for running, but then also for like long term health, my body at 200 pounds isn't going to feel as great as if I maintain a body weight of like, you know, 180 for me and so forth. So it is just thinking, you know, long term and what do you want and so forth. But for the time being, because we, we can and we will go down the rabbit hole of PEDs and hormones and modern perceptions and all that. But uh, I want to stick to those like glory days of powerlifting and, and those vibes and so forth. So one time that uh, one of my sweetest memories, uh, really general, uh, like my life, but always something I kind of look forward to seeing was the cage that animal puts on at uh, the Arnold every year. And I don't I don't know if they still do it after uh, the break with the pandemic and so forth. But I feel like even if they do, it's not it doesn't have the same like feeling and special uh, vibe to it that it did in those kind of glory days that I think you were a part of and and um, some of these other athletes. But uh, for those who don't know, I'll kind of break down and let you run with it. But uh, at the Arnold Expo, which is this giant fitness expo, it's the biggest, you know, towards the East Coast in Columbus, Ohio, obviously named after Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, but tons of brands, booths set up and so forth, Animal being one of those brands that, you know, you were an athlete with for years. And uh, they set up this giant cage, you know, caged off area, have their athletes do kind of insane different feats, whether it's like high rep efforts with heavy weight or one rep maxes or whatever and so forth. And uh, there's just so much energy and grit. And the one thing about animal athletes specifically that I never really used animal products, but I had the shirts. I followed the athletes because the athletes, including you, Dan Green, Evan's amazing. Uh, shoot, Frank McGrath and he was with them. There's like a... There is to use that word again, that purity and like grit behind the athletes. Like these aren't the pretty athletes. These aren't the the washboard, the clean cut, you know, the the uh, poster board childs. You know, these are like the grungy, 
uh, bottom of, you know, basement, literally in your situation, uh, athletes. And I think there's uh, something that we all, you know, like love to and aspire with that and can resonate with. So that's a long preamble. But uh, what I want to ask you is, you know, describe those times that you uh, were lifting in those and mainly like the, the feeling and the adrenaline rush of being in that environment. Yeah, the cage was something I got to experience five times, so five different years. And yeah, I remember the first time I was kind of so the, the Arnold obviously it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in March. That was what yeah. it used to be. I don't know now with the pandemic kind of threw things off, and that's kind of when the cage stopped. But the first year I was on like Sunday, you know, which is pretty quiet. There's not as many people. It's kind of the yeah. uh, the lighter day there at the Arnold. The leftovers. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like you're on the last, you know. You're on the, the prelims kind of thing for like a fight yeah, card, but yeah. it was, it was good. And, and, and that year I'd like, I'd gone into it hoping to pull like 800 pounds and I'd actually been off testosterone for like three months at that point. Cause I was like, I'm going to take a break and it just killed my strength coming off. So I pulled yeah. like 700 and it was like super embarrassing um, because I didn't sleep the night before. And like, it was just a disaster the first yeah. year. But I came back, I got sponsored. I wasn't sponsored the first time. I got sponsored oh, later God. on going into the second year of it. And then I really like went hard into the cage. And I think it was my third year. It was like the peak year where I was on the prime time Saturday session. It was jam packed, wall to wall. You yeah. couldn't walk around. Um, and I was going for a 900 pound deadlift. And it just was crazy energy. Like you could, you, we would get a way bigger turnout for the cage than for any powerlifting. Oh, yeah. I remember, so the one year I went with my wife, we went in 2018, so that might have been the year I think you were pulling 900, um, or like give or take a year, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was, like I mentioned, it's just like the attraction at the Arnold, like, all right, you know, you go around, I always imagine it's like uh, like Halloween for, for grown-ups or for like lifters, because you're going around, you're getting uh, goodie bags, you're just packing it full with samples, and, uh, but then part of my thing was like, Hey, you know, I want to go over to the, uh, the cage and get my entertainment. You know, it's kind of like watching the, the Roman Coliseum back in the day, right. And see these absolute animals just go, you know, go to war. Yeah. It was wild. There were so many feats that I got to witness over the years. I remember Dan Green pulling 900 belt list. Yeah. That was one year. I was there for that. Yeah. Um, there's just all sorts of stuff and you'd have like a front row seat because you're a part of it. So I could just, like, mm -hmm. it felt, it felt like you were. At like an award show and you got to be around all the celebrities because you were inside of the cage just getting to meet everybody and, and that's how you, you know, made a lot of connections and everybody else yeah. was on the outside and it was it was wild because you had like this front row access to seeing this stuff seeing these feats mm -hmm. um like the, the thing too when steve johnson and, and um rob hall pulled like 60 reps yes, back and forth yes, on back and forth yes that was crazy dude went on for an hour we're just <laughs> like all right is this ever gonna end yeah, they yeah. just would go rep for rep. Well, and that's the beauty thing too is it wasn't always just like a singular lift like in a powerlifting meet. It was, you know, sometimes these weird oddities of like how many reps can you do with a set weight or like you mentioned this situation it was this like back and forth war that I think eventually Rob went to like the hospital at the end of it. Uh, but uh <laughs> but it's crazy, man. Yeah, Rob came down with with rhabdo from that. And then Yeah. And his kidneys were like really under a lot of stress. And then Steve Johnson's hands were just destroyed. They were completely ripped apart. So yeah. that was one of the more notable yeah. things. But I, the cage was definitely a highlight of my lifting career. Um, I'd still say maybe like getting flown two years in a row to France where I was dead lifting in the streets mm -hmm. of the French Alps. That was up there. Oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah, there was this this small uh, town. It, not really, 30,000 people. It's called Tonin Le Bon. And it's about 30 minutes from Geneva, Switzerland. So you fly to Geneva, drive 30, 40 minutes over the border, and you're in the French Alps. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of close to uh, Mont Blanc. It's, it's about, I was going to say, it reminds me of uh, Chamonix. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably an hour from Chamonix. And okay. Yeah. Right next to Avian, where the, the Avian water you see at the store all the time. That's where it's, it's kind of where it is. And they would hold this competition in the streets, like these cobblestone streets where they would uh, get a crowd and there was the competition, 100 kilos, 220 pounds for reps on deadlift. And then they do like 150 kilos, 330 pounds, upward to uh, 300 kilos, 661 pounds. Mm -hmm. So they flew us out two years in a row for the 660 pounds for reps, deadlift, no straps or anything. 
And uh, that was just a surreal experience to like experience the different culture and be mm-hmm. lifting in the streets with the backdrop of, of Mont Blanc and all this. And like, yeah, that was probably the coolest lifting experience, even beyond the cage of like, wow, you feel like, okay, I've kind of made it with this, but I, I, I take it for granted. I took it for granted. I, I look back now and I'm like, man, that was like, that was a surreal experience getting to do that two years in a row. Yeah, I'm sure it happens fast. And, uh, you know, one thing I want to ask you, and we kind of round out some of this powerful talk is, uh, you know, how it's changed over the years. So as you mentioned, you know, you mentioned a number number of figures that I know were, uh, you know, part of the kind of rise of powerlifting. Um, Obviously, like Louis passed away, you know, early, I think earlier last year or like later last year, and he was obviously a huge figure um, and so forth. Uh, But I'm also thinking about just how it's changed from, this very like niche kind of sport to now it has become a lot more, you know, commercialized. There's bigger sponsors, there's more money into it. Um, and a lot more younger kids. I almost feel like, you know, when I was growing up, which, you know, wasn't that long ago, just not to sound like an old head, but, uh, you know, people were looking to bodybuilding, right? If you're in the youth, like you mentioned, we're doing it for girls and so forth. And so you want to improve your physique, but now I see a lot of teens, they're getting into it for powerlifting and for, for the strength side of things. So, I guess broad view and wherever you want to dig into this is, you know, what are your thoughts on how it's changed over the years? The good things you've liked or the bad things? Oh, the, the what I was spacing out for a minute was uh, Mark Bell is like an original, you know, figure in that space. A lot of the videos he made and so forth as well. But yeah, like I said, wherever you want to go with how it's changed over the years for good or, or for worse. I think it, it does come down to back then it was so underground and it was so niche mm-hmm. that it just was like, um, it was pure that like we talked about that and that's the best word i can use for it where everybody yeah. was in it not to get attention not to get fame um everybody was in it because that's what you essentially love to do it was more of a passion whereas now i think the lines are very blurred as far as are guys doing this to get famous instagram famous social media famous or do they actually really love the pursuit of it and i think it's like a mix mm-hmm. of both obviously with the, the really great lifters but there's a lot more people trying to make a name for themselves off of the sport than just wanting to be, wanting to do it, wanting to, to lift, wanting, you know, having that passion for it. So none of us back then thought we were going to, we're going to get any attention for it. That's not why I got into it. That's not what the thought process ever was. It wasn't, it was a byproduct. Mm-hmm. It was an afterthought. And I think a lot of people who like rise to, to success in anything, that's how it goes. Like, you know, mm-hmm. people aren't necessarily trying to be famous. They just love what they're doing and they, they roll with it and then it kind of happens, which is kind of what um, Cam Haynes talks about. Like he made a post the other day about mm-hmm. how Rogan stumbled upon him and all that. Uh, yeah, he was never trying yeah. to become famous. He was just kind of like he loved bow hunting and he loved running and all this stuff combined. And then Rogan stumbled upon him and he blew up and he became famous, but he never wanted that. And I don't think it was like that. I think it was like that for me as well, where... I never expected to garner attention or fame, but it just kind of mm-hmm. happened. And now it's different with people. People are just out there to to seek out that fame. Yeah, it's it's interesting too because as you get a larger like uh, pool to gr- to grab from for athletes, you know, you're seeing some young kids that are like 17, 18 that are lifting absolutely you know absurd numbers and also i think powerlifting grabs some people i think of like two camps and maybe these are unfair generalizations to make one more than the other but uh i think you get one side of people who can say oh this isn't bodybuilding i don't really have to look at my diet or my physique doesn't matter i can like lift heavy and people only care like about my like numbers so you get some of those you know people that would uh you know maybe not want to get into it for all the, the dieting and all these different things that come into uh to bodybuilding and you kind of get the the powerlifting culture where they're kind of eating like gummy bears and like you know they emphasize i feel like that kind of community aspect of it i see it a lot in like um the gym i owned and the gyms i went to i'm sure you might see it if you have like a powerlifting kind of crew at your gym you, you definitely know what i'm talking about but then you also you know powerlifting because it is very objective rather than subjective i think it attracts a lot of people because they can literally see the week-to-week progression rather than um physique stuff which can go through different phases of bulks and cuts and it's very subjective and even if you think you look better a judge might say otherwise and it gets a little bit you know gray area and muddied water and so forth and um yeah it just gets a little bit tricky with that so that's why i feel like you know you started to grab in more sex of people that 
wouldn't otherwise maybe get into powerlifting. Um, and yeah, like you said, I, you know, the youth really has, you know, social media has really changed and blurred the lines, like you said, between who is doing it for financial purposes. And some people have like started one way and like you said, kind of transitioned out of it. So I think like Larry Wheels, for example, got really famous for being just absurdly strong, but now um, I don't follow him too much, but it seems like he's done more like skits and bits and become this persona more so. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see the change over the years again, for better and for worse. There's, there's obviously a mix. Yeah. And I mean, I'm like, okay, I understand everybody's, you know, trying to make a living. So I, I can't even hate on that, but like, I, th and I think with Larry wheels too, it's like the way he was lifting, how strong he was, how hard he was pushing. Same with me. It was unsustainable. Like you can get away with it mm -hmm. for 10 years. But at some point, your your body is starting to break down. Yeah, you're having your injuries. body can't do that. Yeah. And and Larry's had a million injuries, and like at some point, you're like, I gotta lay off the PEDs and all this kind of stuff. So with that, you do lose a lot of attention if you can't pivot it. So he's actually pivoted yeah. it pretty well. But um, I I man, that's something I'm trying to do with my following and with my life is is pivot it to an extent. But mm -hmm. people don't there's a lot of pushback with it because people know you for what they know you for. They know you for lifting heavy weights. So when you're doing all this other stuff and completely changing your lifestyle, it's, there's a lot of, uh, not yeah. as much attention. Yeah. I think that we'll, we'll, let's run with that. So, you know, you've transitioned out of powerlifting and, you know, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what are your thoughts on like the longevity of powerlifting? Like, can someone really stick to it for 20, 30 years, competitively or not obviously if you take it a little bit easier you know maybe maybe you can make it but yeah what are your thoughts on the longevity of the average power lifter and then also you know how have you tried to redefine your value to others your identity after this you know extensive powerlifting career because on a smaller scale <clears throat> I know exactly what you're talking about. Even, you know, in my small community, you know, people would perceive me as a bodybuilder, a lifter. I start running. People are like, what the hell? What are you doing running? And then even in the same way, like if I start posting something else, you know, social media is a big driver of this. If I'm, you know, posting all this running content and then maybe one day I post about, you know, another side hobby of mine, specialty coffee or whatever, people are like, what the hell is this? You're the running guy. You're not supposed to do this. And uh, it is difficult, like you mentioned, if you're trying to make a living and you're income relies on this persona or this identity or this specific sport if you no longer want to do that or it's you know a detriment to your health you know you do you can't sacrifice your health or happiness for that income or other people's perception of you right so a lot there but run with it that is dead on to how i feel i'm glad you can relate because sometimes i feel lost in this world of i'm like yeah. i'm trying to be somebody else to an extent i'm trying to pivot and it's not received as well as you think not that there's any negative comments but you can just see from the actual interest it garnered engagement yeah you're like yeah. this is not what people are here for so people come to see power lifting and heavy weights and such and it's like it was going to be at a cost of my health i was gonna it was gonna cut years off my life if i kept going i had mm -hmm. to do something else i i knew if i kept pushing the peds and, and being big and being 250 pounds, I'm like, I'm gonna die much sooner. Why this isn't worth it with a family and a daughter, even at, you know, at the expense of my fame, uh, how fleeting that may be. It's and it hasn't been anywhere near yeah. the same as what it was. But um, it, it's tough because my audience isn't necessarily interested in my running or in my leaning out process. Now I'm like 210 mm -hmm. pounds, whereas I was 250. And I'm, I'm still trying to get lighter. Like I'm trying to get down to eventually like 200 pounds, yeah. 195. Um, and it doesn't interest them as much, but it's like, this is where I'm at in life to where it's my interest. I'm interested in being as healthy as possible, blood work, um, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, running, trying to be a hybrid athlete, get as lean as possible. And then it's just, it's, it's a struggle I go through because I'm like hoping if I keep just buckling down and, you know, putting out content and doing stuff maybe it'll pop again and i'm like my heart's in this my heart's not as much where it was before um i want to be mm -hmm. strong but i want to be healthy so I, I think that's the struggle of like it's not as well received as we'd like a lot of times yeah a brief thank you to today's sponsor pro health 
Are you looking to improve your overall health and longevity? Then it's time to consider NMN, a well-known compound that promotes longevity and supports health. NMN can enhance cellular health, promote DNA repair, and increase NAD plus levels in your body by 38%. So what does all that mean? Well, simply put, it has the potential to help you live a healthier and longer life. So don't wait. Get your NMN now at ProHealth.com. And why ProHealth? ProHealth's NMN is the highest quality, most pure, and most potent NMN in the world. And it's the only NMN proven to boost NAD plus in a double-blind, placebo-controlled, peer-reviewed clinical study. Remember to trust ProHealth.com for all your NMN and supplement needs. Yeah, it is like you said, it, and it can be really depressing. You start, you know, second guessing it when, like you mentioned, you know, you, you start posting one way, and you notice the engagement just, you know, disappears like a ghost, or people aren't perceiving you um, in that same way. So it can just be tough. Or like you mentioned, you know, if it's literally taking years off your life, or it's just not what you want to do. Um, you know, it's good to acknowledge that sooner than than later, and try and take a. Uh, yeah, get out ahead of it rather than letting that identity crisis kind of hit you at a point where it is, you know, like an ultimatum type situation. So I know you're transitioning into like running and, and uh, specifically kind of ultra running too. So tell me a little bit about your past experiences as a runner. I know you told me this in the, in the past, but, you know, share that story a little bit. And then also, you know, what drew you back into running specifically as you exited uh, powerlifting? Yeah, so when I was... 15 years old i hadn't run cross country or anything i had no background with it but i was watching like the kona iron man on tv and i saw that and i was like okay i want to try doing something hard so i started training for a marathon for like five months i want to say five months it was the madison marathon 2007 madison marathon and i trained for it all winter and did like 424 which isn't very good but i didn't really know what i was doing training wise and uh that was kind of the start of it. I kind of became interested. I was subscribed to Ultra Running Magazine. Um, mm -hmm. Like I heard about Anton Krupichka and those guys and Scott Jurek yeah. and all that. Like I was following like hardcore and sport. Like that's when Goggins first came up. And I was like, oh, this guy's mm -hmm. pretty big too. And so that really drew me to him. Um, Dean Karnazes, I read all his books. I was like mm -hmm. in the early days of when it was kind of taking off. Like I was enamored with Western States and Hard Rock and all those races. I was just fascinated by them. So like, I, I, I was more interested in it than actually like training it, but I, uh, cause I was just fascinated with the idea of running like a hundred miles and all this. Um, and then when I was 17, I believe I tried to run the glacial trail 50 in Northern Wisconsin, the North ice age trail. And I got pulled at 25 for missing the cutoff cause I bonked so hard. I just was like completely out of fuel. I didn't eat like at all during the first 25 miles, barely. Did you have any kind of like vest where you like hydrating at all? Do you have any gels? I know it's like the I, industry was different. So there weren't as many options. But. I didn't understand the difference from like a 50 mile or a 20 and a marathon. So I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm probably fine. I don't need to really eat much, you know, just do it twice. Right. <laughs> I had like one gel during the first 25 miles and I had like some uh, electrolyte drink and I just bonked yeah. my tail off and like so i just completely <laughs> gassed and then I, I couldn't make the cutoff and i didn't train like hardly at all for it because i was just burnt out at that point and i was brought in like my longest run was a 10 miler before so i was really lazy with the training but i was like yeah. i'll try it anyway you know i'll try to be like goggins and just you know nail it down and get through run it. through walls <laughs> but i literally yeah. bonked so hard there was no fuel in me i just couldn't get anywhere but then um yeah recently like coming off of PDs and like I've my body, you know, there's times my back hurts or my hips and there's a lot of wear and tear where I'm like, I'm not going to lift the weights I once did. Even on steroids, I might not lift the weights I once did due to the injuries. And I've accepted all this. So I'm like, what would be the best thing to do? Lean down. You know, I've lost since like February 28 pounds and I want to lose another possibly 15. And I want to be just completely basically shredded like zero body fat look like nick bear basically mm -hmm. um yeah. that's why he's like a big inspiration because he's heavier he's 195 pounds but mm -hmm. i'm trying to just really lean down and like running makes me healthier it decreases my resting heart rate decreases blood pressure um all my blood work improves tremendously way more insulin sensitive um all my lipids are way better so it's like one something i can do that's extremely positive for my overall health to almost overcompensate for those years of being unhealthy and it's mm -hmm. it's just motivating it's like it's very hard you know it's not easy you can't 
there's no shortcuts in it in the game like to get faster and, and get better you got to put the work in so that's been humbling but it's a new challenge that i needed mm -hmm. so i have this goal the first goal like the one i'm really focused on is getting a sub 140 half marathon in november so the race is a half marathon november 10th i've been running since february and i'm just gonna try to lose some more body weight body fat and then continue building on that speed base because i want to have a really good speed base and i think that comes out to what, what uh I was gonna say, what pace is that? It comes out to seven fifteen, I believe. Okay, so that's that's moving. It's, it's moving. Pretty it's, good. it's for me. It's incredibly fast to think about for that. Yeah, it'd be for me too. But I'm, I'm like, okay, it's, it's do <laughs> like one thirty. I feel like is is out of the question right now. But one forty, yeah. <laughs> I'm like in in five months, six months. I'm like that might be doable, doable. especially if I keep losing weight. So yeah, I look at that as like a doable goal, but a big goal, and uh. My split in the marathon was a 158 first half, and then I bonked again and ended up at 424 um, mm -hmm. for the full. But I liked, I think, 140 with proper training, which I have now. Like, I know what I'm kind of doing with, like, I actually have kind of a coach here, a guy who is local, mm -hmm. and he knows what he's doing. He programs it out, out the runs. And then that's helped immensely, as well as, like, getting as lean as possible. Because I, I have a lot of muscle still, so I'm just trying to mm -hmm. shed as much body fat as I can and get down to eventually... 200 pounds 195 but um this is like my big goal right now and then after that next year it will snowball into some greater things uh yeah i know <laughs> but one, one of which I'll, I'll talk about you know down the line but one of which i can mention now is i, I want to do the knoxville marathon in april of next year so knoxville okay. marathon would be the next progression um in like april 2nd around there but I also want to still lift. Like I'm trying to get to where I'm still deadlifting 600 pounds at like 200 pound body weight and bench. Yeah. I'd like to be a 340 bencher at about 200 pounds. So I still want to have this. Yeah, so it's not a, yeah, it's not an either or thing. I think that's pretty important. And one thing I was going to bring up too, when you were talking about, you know, refining this identity and trying to pivot was, uh, you know, the good thing is there is this growing i think a lot of it is tr attributed to nick bear and his his success but this growing uh desire for hybrid training and hybrid athletes and this you know side of things and this side of the uh of the fitness space you know there's a lot more people popping up i know you just had uh jack driscoll i think i've seen his his account before and you know the stuff he's doing and um you know there's a bunch of different athletes now that are starting to pop up fergus crawley if you've heard of him you know that are doing all these different endurance feats as well as being really strong um and it's uh it's exciting i think that you know how i jokingly have told a few people lately is uh you know my running i'm I feel like I'm average at best, but what I try and do and position myself on Instagram is, hey, I look more jacked than the average runner, so that stands out in some way, and so that's my like foot in the door to like stand out and gain a sense of a following, and also, you know, runners do get plenty of benefit of seeing the different exercises I do and so forth. All that to say, I think you will definitely stand out over time the more you kind of commit to that form of content of showcasing, hey... You know, here's how I'm making this transition because that'll be very um, fascinating to I think plenty of lifters of hey this guy he is transitioning to running but hey he's still really strong he's still holding muscle still looks jacked you know so that's attainable and then also you know runners can see oh you know I can actually be you know heavier or stronger and it's not going to be a full detriment to my running so it is finding that. Um, you know, balance as well with hybrid training. So I think that's a good good point to ask you is, you know, what is your current split and how have you incorporated running? I know you've told me in the past, I think you're running about like 40 miles a week, but how are you that splitting that up? Like how many days are you running? And also like what exercises have you done differently? Because I know personally coming from, you know, I've been a relatively stronger deadlifter, but uh, so I always thought my glutes were strong, but it was actually a weak glute medius that was causing a lot of IT band pain with me. And so I've had to incorporate some different unilateral stuff and uh, mini band work to try and curb that. Yeah. So, you know, going back quick, quickly, like Nick Bear, he's kind of the guy who started mm -hmm. this whole thing. I feel like I'm in agreement there. He was like the main guy I first saw the motivation for, I feel like everybody else up to that point. But um, so 40 mile weeks, I've touched twice recently. Um, in the last month, I had 40 twice. This week, it's closer to like 30 because mm -hmm. it depends on the schedule. And, and that's part of like, we'll get into that, like owning the gym. It's, it's crazy with clients yeah. and online clients and in-person clients. It. And 
Um, mm-hmm. So sometimes, and having a daughter, sometimes it's like 30 miles, and then I'll, I'll mix it up. So I kind of just recently started, like I said, working with this guy locally, this coach, and uh, mm-hmm. he's really optimized my training. Like I'm already feeling much faster. So I'm not maybe vlogging quite as many miles, but it's much more efficient. So we'll de- we'll yeah. do like two interval workouts a week. Um, about six miles each of different paces and then i'll do typically like two slower six mile runs and then i'll have like a longer run anywhere from like eight to it was up to a half marathon for a while but now it's it's more so eight miles or so and i'm just gradually building up to faster paces losing weight um, building up to vo2 max which i don't know accurate you know the garmin thing they say is pretty accurate from everybody online like yeah look at the videos they're like okay compared to the lab test the garmin's pretty accurate Mine's at 50 right now. Um, it was at like 48. What, what's yours at? My, I don't have a clue because mine, so mine's been funny. So I have both my wrists are tattooed. And so my heart rate doesn't scan right because that actually blocks it. And um, so my Coros, it used to like track it. But now that I've had that, um, it, it, I don't even really look at the heart rate. And it actually, as I was training for my recent ultras, it was telling me I was getting less fit and I was getting worse. So I don't even look at okay, it. Okay, <laughs> that would be frustrating. I understand. That's so why I was going to get a yeah. chest strap too to be more accurate. The chest strap, I'm probably eventually going to invest in. Yeah, I think it's box. better anyway. But yeah, no, but yeah, I'll do. So that's like five five training days a week of running, roughly. I was mm-hmm. doing six for a while, but like when I try to balance lifting with it, I almost have to cut back it's to tough. five. Yeah. Yeah. But six miles is like most days, which I'll do down to the lake and back. Takes, you know, mm-hmm. a little under an hour. Um, and then I'll lift. I'll do like deadlift once a week. And then another day I'll do split squats and back extensions once a week. And then I'll have a day of like pull-ups and lats. And then I'll have two bench days. So I kind of mix in these really quick lifting workouts. Lifting's like secondary to running right now. So lifting... Okay. Lifting's like... I, I, I don't have a set schedule with it. I squeak it in when I can because the lifting base is my foundation. I'm good there. The running is what I have to build up, build up speed and lose weight. That's the key. Like getting faster, I know I'll get faster as I lean down. Um, so I'm prioritizing that. But the lifting, just basically twice a week bench, once a week deadlift, and then like maybe one accessory day with split squats. I'm not even back squatting right now. It's too much pressure on my back, my discs. Yeah. So... That seemed to work, but I'll bang these sessions out in like 45 minutes. So like lifting is very quick, a couple days a week, get it done. Um, try not to lose too much muscle mass, try to maintain as much strength as possible. But I know I have the lifting background, the muscle memory, and I have a lot of muscle mass still, so I'm, I'm not like prioritizing that, whereas I just need to get faster. Yes, it sounds like it's not that much volume. It really is just like hit those you know key compound lifts keep the intensity you know relatively high but uh, it doesn't sound like you have too many other accessory movements right there's no time for it i was doing that for yeah. a while but there's no time for it like between mm-hmm. balancing everything i have to balance and i'm i'm honestly like i'm struggling dude right now like mentally like i have so much on my plate that i feel mm-hmm. stretched so thin that i'm like i'm burnt out a lot of times like a lot, like yeah, I'll be lot. straight up honest. Like I'll, that's why I was going to ask you about your gym and all that. But there's a lot of days where I'm just like completely burnt out. And I, uh, mm-hmm. I've got so much on my plate, so much to balance, so many people to answer to that. Um, I don't have a lot of time, dude. I got to be efficient. Like I got to take advantage of every second to where I'm like, okay, I just put my daughter down for a nap. I'm going to head out the door and get this run out. I'm going to bang it out. Mm-hmm. Like when I put her down for a nap, I'm like time to get the run in. And then like lifting wise, I'm like, I got 45 minutes. I got to, I got to go. So it's high intensity, get yeah. two exercises, like literally two. So it could be bench and dips. It could be just deadlift because deadlift takes a little longer. It's heavier, or it could be split squat and back extension, bang it out, get it done, move on. Um, because I'm like, I got to answer all these emails. I got to get YouTube content up. I got to get, um, I got to like make my food for the next day, do dishes when I go home all this stuff yeah. shower like it, it's yeah. just the, my days are insane i wake up at 4 30 to open the gym i'm i'm mm-hmm. I'm training people one-on-one i'm just like yeah it's almost like a breaking point where you're like i can't do anymore yeah. but i know yeah, you like I, I definitely yeah yeah i definitely can relate to that and for the longest time so we owned our gym for two years but like i mentioned i have sold it um since but i you know for the first year 
well, maybe like six months, we had it where it, was, it wasn't 24-7 and we had like set hours. And when we did that, it was like really hard because we didn't have staff. And, uh, you know, especially starting up from scratch, you're not p paying a bunch of staff or employees. Don't want to put that into it. And so, yeah, getting up crack of dawn, 5 a.m., opening the gym. I'm there all day. Like, luckily, we lived like 10 minutes away for most of the time we owned it. So, like, sometimes I would, you know, lock the door quickly run home and shower after workout or grab something during like slow times and just hope no one who wanted to sign up came then book it back. And then I'm there till like six. Uh, my wife would, would like stay the later shift and I'm in bed before she gets home. So like you're sacrificing time with your wife or in your situation with your daughter. So it gets really hard with that. And then the specific thing that I think, you know, non-gym owners can relate to is uh, the thing with endurance training is it there is no workaround uh, with efficiency with with running. Like if it's a two hour run, it's a two hour run. Like lifting, you know, you can kind of, you know, finagle some different things or try and train in a more efficient way. Maybe skip an accessory or two. But uh, for the most part, like running is is just it's a time thing, especially when it's long distance running. And then as a hybrid athlete, you're trying to do your three to five, whatever it is, lifting sessions, but then you also have your, your running session. So it ends up being like, you know, an hour to two, two and a half hours a day of training that you're trying to squeeze in into your life. And, uh, yeah, I could, you're not alone with that. And I, I, I definitely have felt to like the brink before. And one thing that helped me and not to say that you can, or haven't already done it with your gym, but switching to like 24 seven and then just, you know, try it, the hard thing was switching to a 24 seven access and like limiting our hours of staff was uh it, it freed up some like time but it also added some stress of what happens when i'm not there especially if you have younger crowd you know a hole in the wall you see the next morning infuriates you um so there's like you know different factors to it i mean we could again go go deep into the whole thing of owning a gym because i can relate to that and and remember some of those struggles but um yeah dude it's it's tough you know i had a podcast last week i was talking to another uh, a buddy of mine an ultra runner in fair play colorado and one thing that we touched on is with training it's just sacrifices and it sounds obvious but you know the sacrifices are ugly sometimes you know like if you're training for an upcoming ultra and you got to get in some four-hour run you're gonna have to skip time with your family you're gonna have to you know you're you're putting pressure on your wife to pick up for your daughter and spend more time with her because you're not there, you know, work extra hours at the gym. And it's, it's like difficult, painstaking sacrifices. But as long as you understand one, that this specific goal is extremely important to you and it's, you know, and then, and then two, understanding that it is like a limited time period that you're making this commitment. And then, you know, you can take a break, have an off season and try and, you know, pick up there. But all that to say, uh, I, I completely uh, understand where you're coming from. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to ask you, like, what led to you guys selling the gym? Was it one of these deals where you were like, because I listened to your podcast about it, but you didn't really say, like, yeah, why? You... I didn't dig into it too much. Uh, yeah. What, what so, led to it? We sold the gym. Uh, it was a couple of things. So, like, one, we wanted to move out west. Both of us born and raised in that general area. And we're like, hey, we want to move. We want to experience this different life get out towards the mountains for a variety of reasons. And obviously with having a physical business, that makes it really tough, right? And we had set up the gym in a very, you know, regardless of moving, I had set up the gym in a very automated way where we had it 24 seven. Then eventually I kind of shortened the hours even more and also set up the website to where our gym software, where uh, people could buy memberships and day passes online and then they could literally fill out the information on the app on their phone and then scan into the gym on the barcode like within a matter of five to ten minutes um, so like theoretically i didn't need to be there but the big thing with owning a business too is like that personal connection seeing a, a consistent face that the members get that i'm sure you relate to and having that sense of community to where as much as i was still there a lot of the day i just felt like uh I wasn't giving it the the attention it, it like deserved. And so then another thing I was thinking about with owning the gym was uh, it was always like as much as it was a passion project, uh, it started to become kind of secondary because it wasn't and it could have paid a small income, but it wasn't a main income source for me. And I was still because it was a small enough gym where I could still do for reference. A lot of the work I do now as a main income source is freelance video editing for real estate agents. And I've done that for about five years. Um, so a lot of remote work. So I could do that while I own the gym, 
all that to say, I was focused more on my personal brand on Instagram and the income I was making than the gym, which easily sustained itself, but was just becoming a distraction. Like you said, there's still a massive time commitment and so forth. So that was another factor. And uh, the other thing was just like really sitting down and thinking about it, talking to my wife and being like, hey, you know, a gym isn't something you can really like half ass in my opinion. Like if you're going to own it, it is like you got to be hands on. You got to be looking for the next innovative touch. You got to be delegating and hiring people. You got to be reinvesting more, which we reinvested plenty into it. We kind of just reinvested all the income from it. But you got to be continuously trying to, to grow it and evolve it. And I realized that this wasn't something I wanted to commit myself to for 10, 20 years, the rest of my life where like, I'm a gym owner. This is like going to absorb my life. I didn't want that for myself. And so it came to that realization. So what we were going to try and do was uh, manage it from afar from Colorado, because like I mentioned, we had a lot of it automated. All we really needed to do was kind of have like a, a general manager that was going to see over some stuff and maybe hire one or two staff. And uh, I'd already had a buddy of mine that owned a smaller supplement company in the area. He was subleasing out of my gym. And so he was probably going to be managing it and so forth. But looking back now, how things ended up, I think it would have been a disaster. Honestly, I think it just would have been very difficult to manage that from afar and trust this and that. And so I'm really, it was really fortunate and, uh, you know, luck of the draw that we we found somebody who owned a, a, a bigger gym up in Northern Virginia that was looking to expand uh, was interested in our location and uh, we, we like came to sign terms like days before we moved. So uh, yeah, so that hopefully explains uh, where my mind was at. Maybe some of the same struggles you experience. Dude, that is like echoing my sentiment because I'm in the same boat to where the gym is not a money maker. And for a lot of guys, people don't realize like gyms are not profitable for a lot of people. Yeah, We're not commercial gyms. We're competing with Planet Fitnesses and Gold's Gym. Our mm -hmm. city has like eight gyms. They have a Gold's, a Planet Fitness, uh, a National Fitness Center, all these corporate gyms. And it's like, we're a niche gym. Like, we're a boutique type mm -hmm. gym. We don't have, we're not killing it. There's no profit in the gym business. So it's not my main source of income either. It's like my main source of income is powerlifting, um, coaching, and, and some of these other mm -hmm. things. So it's like, I'm kind of at that same point where I feel like, I'm half in, half out mentally, where I'm like, I like the community, but I don't feel all in with it. I feel a little stretched too thin where I'm like, I'm having to worry about my main source of income that puts food on my table and pays my bills. And then there's the gym. And so it's like a mm -hmm. big struggle where I'm like, I don't know. I, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's tough because, uh, yeah, it's like you go into it because you're, you know, you idolize it as a kid, right? Growing up or lifting, you're like, oh, everyone wants to own a gym and you do it. But like you said, you know, there are some gyms that can be very profitable. Typically they're commercial or group exercise or whatever, but these niche gyms, you know, they can be profitable, but that's after like decades of work, you know? I mean, it's, it's really difficult to make one of these niche gyms, like really make you meaningful profit relative to how much work you put into it, relative to like the hours you spend there. It's just really difficult. And then the, the harder part too is it absorbs all your attention and time like a sponge. Like you can't really diversify your other interests because it is taking up that much of attention. Um, and then another thing that I think you're probably experiencing too for personal experience is this, you know, detachment to where, like you mentioned, you love the gym, you're proud of it, you love the community, but your world doesn't revolve around lifting anymore. And so now you're looking and you're like, oh, you know, my existence, my purpose is, you know, beyond this, these like three lifting movements, right? And you're like, hey, I love lifting. I do, but I also love running. I love my family. There's different aspirations I have in my life. And uh, you're, yeah, you're looking down the barrel of, of this gym and just second guessing like the longevity of, of, of it and like the fulfillment it can consistently provide. Correct. Is that accurate? That is correct because. <laughs> I think my interests have evolved, which I hear like every seven years, your interests do evolve. And uh, I'm not, it, and it was more, I gotta say, I gotta preface things. Like it was more my wife's, it, it was her idea. She was, she grew up in the industry. She always wanted to have a gym of her own. She's the one who really like put her heart and soul into this place. 
Um, and I remember like I, I related to your story where you were talking about the, the glue on the freaking under the carpet and what a disaster yes, that yes, was. Yeah. Cause I had to get a buffer <laughs> thing from home Depot and I had to literally yep, we did too. buffer the dang glue off for 24 hours mm -hmm. total. And it was the worst job I've ever done in my life. And just so many things like <laughs> painting all this million buckets of paint and like it's awful mm -hmm. things. But, um, she really, it's her heart and soul. She's put the work in, but it's, it's always difficult to put your heart and soul into something and see very little for return, return on mm -hmm. it to where you're like, I'm investing all this time and effort in, and it's not even paying my bills at all. Um, I have to do all this other side stuff to pay my bills. That's where it's kind of like, man, this is tough. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just something I'm always like struggling with because I do, I'm very busy too with my online clients like online yeah. clients are what literally keeps me from starving to death so I, I have to prioritize that and then i'm like there's not a lot of energy where i'm also having to train clients one-on-one -on -one and all the all the money you're generating is going to the landlord and going to utilities and it's just it's it's yeah. tough it's very very tough yeah i used to uh <laughs> Gosh, man, I I think I'd blow people's mind. I'm sure you would too if you told them like the cost of a uh, heating a building like that, or like oh the utility gosh. bill each month is uh especially in the winters are just yeah winters in Virginia, but definitely in, or summers. I mean, both really, it was both bad really, yeah. Both. And I'm sure, you, yeah, exactly in Tennessee. I'm sure as well. Uh, but real quick, I want to talk about um, like you mentioned, and then I want to get to the whole hormone therapy and a lot of your experience with that. But as while we're on this topic, the importance of interest evolving because. I think that's something that, uh, you know, I've talked to with, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like Matt Vincent um, yeah. and some of the stuff he does and other people. And uh, it's something that it's so crucial to like your identity to have multiple interests because when you tie yourself to like a singular focus, a singular thing, I am a powerlifter. Well, what happens if you get injured and you're no longer competitive? It's like you lose you lose who you are, you lose your happiness, you lose everything that you told yourself about yourself. And it's you just you just get lost. And I think a lot of times people just like either allow certain roles or labels to get tied to them. And they either like accept that or they tie them to themselves. And they don't kind of have like a plan B or diversification of things, right? So like people always talk about diversification, diversification of income, right? But the same should go with your own personality the same should go with your own interest because you know if i don't have lifting well i have running well if i don't have running i have lifting or i have coffee or i have you know family or these different things that i'm interested in and it kind of keeps you afloat um and allows you to pivot because otherwise you do just run into these like crisis scenarios where you know you, you would like to just again be be ready and be proactive about the next steps in your life because like you mentioned you're not going to have this 30 40 80 year long you know powerlifting career or any career or even own this gym right there there are endpoints to things and i think uh being realistic about that and and diversifying where you're spending time is uh important in the long run yeah i think that's huge because i struggled with that mightily like when i could feel my powerlifting career was kind of coming to a close and i was having this identity crisis because that's everything i'd been known for for years and i had gotten so like so much attention for it um it was really hard to where you're like okay far fewer people care about me now that i'm not lifting mm -hmm. these massive weights and you feel obsolete you feel like you're kind of like getting passed by which is the same struggle guys go through in the nfl when their career is coming to an end yeah but it's almost like the show yeah. must go on you have to find something else so seeing you know you have to pivot and that's where I, I found like guys like nick bear and i was like okay he's pretty big and he's still as fast as heck and that that led to the motivation to i could still be strong have a good physique and then i kind of found some of you other guys i found you know well i was gonna say um with, with like mark and alan i know you went on mark's podcast recently like what what have they said has been the reason for them transitioning is it purely from like health or are they i know mark just did the boston but like does he have like bigger goals beyond that i that's such a good question that i wish i had asked him <laughs> no but like because he he talked to me a little bit and i think i think with him i'm, I'm speaking for him because i didn't i wish i would have yeah. asked him that's a fantastic question i think it's more so that he tried for that that 600 pound pound bench first and his 600 pound bench goal on a powerlifting meet was the equivalent to me trying to hit 900 to me 
I did it in training, never did yeah. it in a meet. He he didn't quite get there. He had a pec tear. Then he dieted down. He you know he wanted to be healthier. I think he saw that he needed to be healthier, and he got mm-hmm. down to like two hundred pounds and tried to bench five hundred pounds, and he kind of did that. And he he kind of found some other goals where he kind of knew his time was coming to a close with powerlifting, and he just was looking for something else. And that's exactly. Yeah, I think it's like what we're talking about just like being able to pivot and be like just finding enthusiasm for a variety of things in life, right? Like just finding the next thing that you can kind of get excited about and and push through. And I guess the same theme that relies in all of these things, whether it's different feats and lifting or whether it's running or whatever, is just uh, being enthusiastic about something and just finding a sense of progression and whatever it is. Getting better at something gives us a, a feeling of uh, something to work towards and a feeling of like fulfillment, right? Because you like don't want we we act like we want this like end goal and, and to like to reach like a summit but really once you reach the summit it's it's bleak right that's spot on I, without a goal i feel lost truthfully yeah like if i'm not and for a while it was all lifting related goals but once that wasn't a thing anymore i was like i gotta find a new goal i i so that's where the 140 half marathon comes in it's i need something to work towards or i literally would probably lose my mind. I'd, I'd be so depressed. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. So we all need an outlet to where we're like pursuing something difficult to sharpen us. And that's where I'm at now. I'm like, I need to be, I need something to sharpen me. Running provides that. It's very hard for me. It never came easy. So it's like, it's the next challenge. It's the next way I can, I can fulfill myself. All right, guys, that's it for this episode. Pete had a little bit of microphone issues. So what we're going to do is do a part two entirely centered on hormone health and TRT and a lot of the changes he's made in his life further down the road in another like four or six weeks. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. If you have any questions you'd like me to ask him on our second episode, whether it's powerlifting related, gym owning, um, past experiences, running, hybrid training, anything like that, or hormone related, uh, please let me know and I'll be happy to ask him in our next episode. Make sure you guys uh, share the podcast. If you got something out of it, enjoy it. Check out Pete. I'll leave all of his information and links in the show notes. Follow the podcast, subscribe, whatever you got to do, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode.